just giving a little bit of background about a study that we did at UniSA with inter, uh, University of South Australia funding to look at the diversity of our students because one of the things that uh, I guess concerned us was that um, within Australia we, we have a, a macro uh, agenda which is um, about widening participation. And, you know, I think it's a global trend generally that we are trying to attract students from my, more diverse backgrounds. Um, and one of the net results of that is that they're targeting, uh, by 2020, the goal is that 20% of the student population of every university in Australia will be made up of students from um, low socioeconomic backgrounds, students with special needs, uh, and and sort of that that high target equity group now that brings with it a whole range of interesting challenges for academics um, and it comes at a time when resources are even more scarce than before so the, the the resources available to support this kind of diverse student population is um, becoming less it's also occurring at a time where we're scaling up the use of online technology and offering our programs in fully online mode which raises a whole range of new sorts of support issues and so we were concerned because the rhetoric a lot of the rhetoric in Australian context has been around and I'm sure it applies here the net gen population the digital native and so on and we really wanted to problematize that term because uh, and, it, and, you know, there's certainly been a lot more literature in more recent years since uh, uh, Mark Krensky came up with the, the called the um, net gen population, the, the digital natives. And I guess you're all familiar with Krensky's concept of the digital native or, or not? Anyone not? Um, I mean, basically, the assumption that students entering universities today are already digitally literate, they're wired differently because of their early introduction to digital technology and therefore they think differently than other students and from us who he classifies as digital immigrants mm. because we didn't grow up with the technology and I don't think it will take much encouragement from those here to debunk uh, some of the myths associated with that. For a start, I'm more digitally savvy than most of my young students who are coming straight from high school. Mm -hmm. There's also an assumption that the, all the students, and even in Mark Prensky's later work where he starts to talk about moving beyond the digital native, digital immigrant, talk about binary divides, um, uh, he started to talk about the fact that, you know, we won't need to even make that differentiation because the digital natives are growing up and ousting all us digital immigrants. Uh, and of course that's also uh, quite problematic in, it, in itself because it is assuming that there are differences that can be equated according to the exposure to the technology and we know it's much more than just about exposure to the technology we also know of course that many of our students don't grow up with with the digital technologies or the access we also with widening participation have more and more adult students you know who are mature age students who are coming into our universities um, so you know when we start to look at widening participation we recognize that yes technology is here but it's most certainly not evenly distributed. And our students certainly don't have the same range of experiences. And, and an assumption that access to technology, I, I think we've matured in our understanding of that concept of the digital divide. The digital divide is no longer just about access to technology, it's also about digital literacy and the ability to use the technology effectively. So, we really wanted to unpack this concept of the digital native or the net gen student. So what we did was we basically undertook a survey of all students, I mean all students at UniSA were invited to participate. We modelled our survey on previous work that had come out of the University of Melbourne with Gregor Kennedy and Kerry Lee Krause at our 
who looked at their population and we were a couple of years after that so we thought it would be really interesting to compare the findings. So we were aware that the rhetoric was saying that, you know, that young people uh, who've grown up with digital technology have particular characteristics. Now some of that I do observe in my students, the ability to multitask, the, oops, sorry, I've gone one step too far. Oops. You've gone back. I've gone back. Yeah. That's because I'm trying to work in a ridiculous um, ergonomic situation. Yeah. Ability to multitask, the desire for immediacy, multimodal learning. What really interested me, and I'm certainly seeing it a little bit with my emerging students, is this notion of you know being connected all the time, like like to be connected. But also, and the last point was one that I really embraced, I guess, because of my interest in social justice and community engagement and service learning, interest in things that matter. You know, and that's where the authentic learning comes in of, you know, really wanting to give students activities and assignments that are going to make it, they feel are making a difference to the world and that are relevant and situated in their context rather than abstract assignments that don't make a, you know, aren't necessarily going to make a huge impact. Um, and so you'll see some of the interesting language that's emerged, emerged around the kind of notion of these new students entering. Net Gen, Gen Y, Millennials, Digital Natives, and this is the one I love, Homo Zappians, <laughs> uh, which was dubbed by Veen in 2005. However, as you see the point that I've raised there, despite uh, that rhetoric, evidence is rising that um, that, you know, they're not a homogeneous population. We can't assume even that the transition from um, the use, because uh, one of the other interesting things is how much do we use social media in our, in our teaching and learning? And, you know, we don't even know whether it's appropriate to use social media within our teaching and learning. We, we just don't know that answer because that's a social space for the students to interact with. If we start encroaching on that social space, do we turn them off? We already know that the population in Facebook has started to decline. The, of the younger population as us older people have started to uh, <laughs> infiltrate. So, you know, we, we, there are unanticipated consequences as we start to engage with all these new and emerging technologies without really <coughs> understanding the diversity of our students' needs. And of course, the other interest that I have is in students with disabilities and many of these rich media technologies are simply not accessible for our students. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realise I had blown up versions of that. All right, so, um, so basically this was the project where we surveyed all of our undergraduate students to get a better understanding. We wanted to understand the better pedagogical benefits of the use of these emerging technologies we wanted to know much more about it, the diversity of our student population and we wanted to develop <coughs> strategies to help the students to transition <coughs> and to make effective use of their ICTs. Um, and so in this particular presentation I really just want to capture some of the diversity that emerged from the findings from that study. So obviously we, we got ethics approval, as I said we modelled it on um, uh, the work done by Kennedy et al. Um, at the University of Melbourne. They focused on first year learners. We surveyed all of our students. And it was, um, it was a survey that incorporated quantitative and qualitative questions. And you know we gathered demographic information, how they were using technology, their perceptions of the effectiveness of the use of the tools at university, uh, and the learning outcomes for those students. So our student population is 30,000 roughly. Um, whoops. It's very responsive too. Um, back to you. Let's go to the next one. I don't know why it's doing that. Yeah. Mm. Um, and um, of those, uh, we sent out invitations via the university portal. Uh, we did have an incentive. There was a draw prize. Um, so it wasn't a highly representative um, population who responded, only 812 of the total 38,000. However, 812 is not a, a small population in its own right. 
And so those findings really add to um, the other findings that, uh, of Kennedy et al. So of those 812, 77% were born after 1980. So they would be described as the digital native population or the net gen learners. Most common year of birth, etc., is there. Um, most, uh, you know, nearly half of them were in their first year of study at the time of the survey, and of those, 30, nearly 36 percent were described as net gen learners, i.e., they were born after 1980. 27 percent identified themselves as completing year 12 uh, the year before, so they were straight from they were school leaders. Uh, the majority were female. Uh, I'm not sure if that's self-selecting because of the nature of the survey. There were nearly 22% of non-English speaking background, 13% identified themselves as international students. Sadly, only in the Australian context, this is not unusual, 0.6% identified as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, which is quite a contrast from the South African context of the university, certainly at a university like UWC. Uh, nearly 5% reported as having a disability of some kind. What was interesting was the mix, you know, um, of those respondents, 83%, uh, 84% were part-time, were, were full-time, nearly 15% part-time. Most students were enrolled internally and only 14, nearly 14% 14 externally. Significant proportion of the students, 66%, were undertaking paid employment and working an average of 17.7 .7 hours a week, and that was including our full-time students. Um, and full-time internal students were re reporting, you know, up to 14 hours, external students up to 29 hours a week and trying to manage study. Some of them um, some of the older students in the population also had families, you know, that they were caring for. Most of the students did have a computer. The majority spent over 10 hours per week for study. 9% uh, indicating they used the internet for an average of 10 hours. Large proportion of the students using computers to play music files, accessing the internet on a daily basis. Um, and most using it daily or weekly for study related purposes, uh, using s computers to manipulate images, use audio and video. Many students are not using the internet to build or maintain a website or use social bookmarking. Um, so there's quite, quite an interesting pattern there. Not surprisingly, Facebook was the most frequently used uh, social networking site. Um, and up to 14 times per week or twice a day on average. <laughs> Males were tending to use and um, manipulate digital media, play music, play games more frequently than females. They also tended to be using the web for general information more than females. Um, males tend to be more frequent users than females of Skype, blogs, watching YouTube videos. There was no significant gender difference for Facebook, which wasn't all that surprising. Um, year of birth was con is a consistent predictor of increase in use of technology, so the, the younger students were using technology more often. Um, international students accounting for roughly 100, well, 104 of the responses, uh, and nearly 22% are reported being non-English speaking background. Of the international students, um, nearly 80, well, nearly 80% 80 are of non-English speaking background nearly 60% of international students female, 40% male. Majority of international students um, were studying in health sciences and business. International students emerged as the largest users of the technologies, which was the first of our understandings that there was in fact even a difference between our local students and our international students. Um, now this was a concern to us, given the importance of digital technology for students with disabilities, students who identified as having a disability use the internet significantly at a probability level of uh, less than 0.01 for many purposes. So the very users who can benefit the most from the technology were the, one of the least likely to be using it. It says something about access to technology.
Um, although students, were using uh, students with disabilities were using the technology less, it appears that most of the reduced activity was in relation to social applications, which is also a great concern for students with disabilities, especially students with communication disabilities. Students with a disability also indicated that they would be more likely to ask a tutor or lecturer for help than students without a disability. These are really worrying trends. Um, there were no other um, statistically significant differences, but I'm emphasising statistically. These were all statistically significant. Now, this was also concerning students in employment accessing web services more on mobile phones. Um, Part-time students use the web for general information and mobile phone for email more than full-time. Full-time students use Facebook and Skype more and read and watch blogs and YouTube more than part-time. Part-time students are using Web2 technologies less than full-time students. The findings suggest there may be a negative impact on student engagement with ICTs for students who are studying part-time and employed at the same time. So what a lot of the data was saying was that if they are trying to cope with employment and study, they have less time to use the technology. I'm seeing some nods of heads, so I'm presuming this is resonating uh, with some of you. So clearly the findings are showing that there was a greater diversity, even though the majority, the vast majority of the participants in this survey were NetGen digital natives. It was huge diversity. The younger students are participating and using, with, using these technologies more than the older students, but there's considerable variability amongst those groups. While age is a factor, the difference in patterns of use we found could not be attributed to any generational group. There are a range of other factors, and they demonstrate that within that population there's considerable diversity among international, non-English speaking background students and students with disabilities. Um, so really, I think, interesting findings, which certainly, I guess, highlighted some of our assumptions that you know the technology isn't evenly distributed, access to the technology is not evenly distributed, and there is considerable variation amongst our population. So I want to move on now. So that's just by sort of the, the background study to move towards more focused study on how we've been exploring access for students um, with diverse backgrounds, but particularly students with disabilities using some of these new emerging technologies. Um, so first of all, just talking about the whole notion of the inclusive education. Um, inclusive education can be defined as the right of every child or young person to access mainstream education, regardless of their abilities, race, gender, nationality, or any other factor. And of course, that underpins the, certainly our Australian national agenda in terms of widening participation. It's that basic recognition of the importance of the rights of all students to have equal access to services and education. And of course, these are inscribed in any number of international conventions now. The most recent in terms of our students with disabilities being the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, uh, which opened for signature in March 2007. Um, there are now, I, think, I don't think I've got the figure on this presentation, but there are now literally hundreds and hundreds of um, countries that are signatories, including South Africa, mm -hmm. including uh, Australia was in fact the first Western country to sign up to the convention. So Article 24 is of particular relevance because it focuses on uh, the rights of persons with disabilities to education uh, as being a fundament fundamental basic human right. Um, however, as many authors have attested the themes of social inclusion and education for all have actually come out of first world states so you know we need to have a more nuanced understanding of what we mean by inclusive education because there are con some concerns that they're consistent with more neoliberal forms of governance in other words 
the idea that assimilation of difference makes it easier to manage students. In other words, instead of identifying diversity as richness that, come, that we can adapt our teaching to accommodate the diversity of our students, not as a deficit model, but rather as recognizing that this, the very diversity of our students brings richness to the curriculum, which means, brings with it the importance of understanding um, the student experience at the individual level and accommodating, not from a deficit model, but rather from the model that they're enriching the curriculum. But unfortunately, a lot of the kind of premises around the way in which inclusive education has been approached has been at the deficit model of what do we have to do to accommodate these specific student needs. And I'm sad to say, even in the Australian context, you know, despite the fact that we are signatories to the UN Convention, despite the widening participation in gender, despite the fact that um, we also have a requirement now in Australia that all government websites must be compliant with international W3 standards on accessible web design. Um, the practice doesn't match the principles, okay? So to give you a, a good example, most universities in Australia, um, and we had this discussion yet, yesterday, because I think you know your university is considering it as well with the UWC is uh, we we podcast we vodcast every lecture automatically <coughs> right so every single lecture is automatically recorded we have no option by the way it's just recorded and it is streamed um, almost instantaneously there's a small gap in time but then it's published to the web okay well that that's got some great advantages for students who are studying off campus. I mean, it's great for my students. I've got external students. It means that they can engage in the lecture off campus. But what does it mean for hearing impaired students? None of it's transcribed. So this is what I mean by the deficit model. If a student is hearing impaired, they can request that a transcript be made available, but it is not standard practice. And yet if we think about the number of students who benefit from transcriptions, if we think about different learning styles and different ways in which we absorb information, I don't like watching vodcasts. I much prefer reading notes. You know? I don't have a disability as such, but I find it easier because I skim read. I can read faster than I can listen. Students in non-English speaking background benefit from having the combination of the transcript and the audio. So we, it shouldn't be a deficit model where we only respond when there's an urgent need. Now, of course, there are economic constraints, and that's the, re the sad reality, that we make accommodations only on the basis of express need because of limited resources. But it's really not an acceptable solution that a certain group of our students have to specifically identify as needing special um, requirements to be met. It should just be standard. Why should students have to even identify as having a disability? Why shouldn't it just be mainstream? Because that's what really inclusive education is about. It's about ensuring everyone has equal access. Um, so, as I say, I think it's really largely, it's partly about managing difference and it's a partly about an economic rationalist argument. Um, so, Alan has talked about the proliferation of theories that have emerged out of kind of research around inclusive education. Um, but what, what Alan argues is we really haven't engaged with thinking about how we refashion our approaches to teaching and learning to be truly inclusive, to embrace diversity in all its richness. So, in, in Alan's terms, you know, this notion of standardization of inclusion has just re-territorialized difference, leading to a focus on management rather in, than engagement with difference. All right, so the other problem is we still have this kind of binary notion of students with disabilities and those that don't have disabilities, instead of, again, thinking of all students as individuals with differences, diversity. We're all different. 
and there's multiple layers of difference. You know, I might be female, I might have a disability, and I might be of non-English speaking background. There's no binary in that. It's just a combination of who of different aspects of my person. So um, the social model is probably the, the still fairly trendy in terms of understanding about disability. And the social model, for those that are not familiar with it, is basically a, an opposition to the medical model. The medical model was we need to find a way to cure disability, um, and it's a problem. The social model has moved the disability away from the individual to society and said society has the problem because it's not accessible to students with disabilities. But the problem with the social model is it's still a deficit model, isn't it? It's still saying there's a problem about having a disability. Either the problem is you were born with the disability or the problem is society's not accommodating the disability. Instead of engaging with the fact that it's just about diversity, it's not about whether you have a disability or not. So it is still about that whole Cartesian view, that binary model which we're trying to break away so the model that I really like is the biosocial theorizing model which uh, Gable and Peters came up with, which is recognizing that we are all unique dif individuals, that we are born with certain physical characteristics. We have all, to a certain extent, been exposed to different social contexts which have resulted in some kinds of physical, social or emotional oppression. And every single student in our class comes from a particular cultural context and brings with them a whole range of experiences, both positive and negative. So embracing diversity is understanding that we need to recognize the individuality and the richness of that diversity. So it's moving away from the tragic or the problem view of disability that was underpinned by that to more looking about affirming the differences in our students and the richness that that brings. And the other thing I think is really important to emphasize here is that not all people with disabilities regard themselves as having a disability. Okay, so certain groups of people with disabilities um, would, would argue that um, they represent a minority group, for example. You've probably heard um, there are certain people who are deaf, and I think that's on a slide later on here. Yes, deaf community. And again, I d I'm very careful to say that not all people with a hearing impairment identify with a capital D of belonging to the deaf community. That's not a homogeneous <coughs> group either. But there are certain individuals who are hearing impaired or deaf who consider themselves part of the capital D deaf community. And they don't see that as a in a deficit way at all. They consider themselves to be a minority community or a minority culture. Why? Because they like to communicate in signing. And they believe signing to be a much richer means of communication than oral or verbal communication. So they don't see that as a disability. They actually see that we're probably a little more impoverished in our communication because we don't have the same ability to communicate. And if you watch signing, it is incredibly empowering and, and, and it's an emotional experience because of the, the gestures and, and all the rest that goes with that. So it's a very expressive language, which quite frankly, verbal communication does miss. Okay, so, you know, we've got to be really careful that we shouldn't be assuming that all people who identify as having an impairment consider it to be a disability at all. Similarly, uh, many people with, on the spectrum, as we call it, the, on the, uh, who are autistic or who have Asperger's syndrome, don't regard themselves as having a disability at all. Again, they consider themselves to be a minority population who are disadvantaged um, because of the particular characteristics that they have, which they consider in their population to, to be uh, extraordinary. Okay, so they don't consider themselves as having a disability at all. What's more, people who identify as being part of that community regard uh, efforts to find a miracle cure for autism 
as killing, and I've seen um, discourse on blogs by communities of people with autism as trying to kill off who they are because they regard themselves, they have a heightened sensitivity and to them that's a richness that we can't ever experience. So, you know, I, I guess I'm really emphasising that diversity is a very complex um, uh, area of study and that for us to really engage is that how I've been? I've worked out what I'm doing now. I've hit the right button by mistake because of the awkward angle. <laughs> um, so one of the things is that we're recognising now that online communities become a, a powerful vehicle for some of these groups of individuals to communicate effectively together. Um, and certainly, um, 3D virtual worlds have been one of those spaces where many communities with, of people with disabilities have found a safe place where they can get support for each other and not be judged. And uh, I just want to give you a, a couple of examples from the virtual ethnography that I did. So a lot of you haven't been to my earlier presentations, but um, are you all familiar with virtual worlds? 3D virtual worlds such as Second Life. Okay, so um, I was interested because we've got an Australian Learning and Teaching Council grant for the watch time. Can you time keep? Yeah, sure. Um, um, and what we wanted to do was explore, and, and I've been running workshops now for mm, a couple of years <laughs> uh, at UWC about how we can use virtual worlds like Second Life um, uh, in, in a range of different courses and, and how we can also engage with diversity through that. And so one of the things that uh, I had this Australian National Teaching and Learning Grant uh, in order to explore the pedagogical benefits of 3D virtual worlds like Second Life, um, but also to adapt a viewer to be more accessible to students with um, disabilities. But before I could do that, I really needed to understand how people with disabilities were engaging with such a rich media environment. And many people were saying, well, blind people couldn't possibly be using Second Life because it's a visual medium, it's a three-dimensional medium. And yet we found there were many people who were blind who were using adaptive technologies that have been designed by the communities in Second Life, such as the virtual guide dog, which is, was developed by my programmer for this project. Um, and that's exactly as it sounds, a virtual dog rigged up to look like a guide dog who can guide a blind user or in, using audio to transport their avatar from one place to another, tell them the names of avatars who are nearby, and narrate all the text chat in audio. Mm -hmm. And so we adapted our technology to the, the virtual guide dog. And for those that are worried about the stereotype of the guide dog, because I can hear you you're thinking there, the, um, the reason for that was, and in fact the package that you get when you would download the virtual guide dog came with a white cane as well, yes, another stereotype, and a subtle bracelet, okay? You'll be pleased to know. All right, so why have the visual props that are so stereotyped? Well, because we actually found out that some, through this ethnography, we found out that several people who were active in the virtual world and blind wanted to identify as a person who was blind. And the reason that they, we had to give them the option of the virtual guide dog and the white, white cane was they wanted to appear in the virtual as they did in the physical world. And if they used a guide dog in the, in the real world or the physical world, they wanted a guide dog in the, the virtual world. But the guide dog was also quite functional in many ways because for them it identified them to other users as having a disability. Now you might say, well, that's that defeats the purpose of the virtual reality where you can be and look anything you like. But it allowed them to signal to someone, please be patient, I might bump into you. All right, because people can get a bit impatient in the virtual world. They want instantaneous text responses. So if you visually 
see an avatar that apparently has a disability, of course you don't know for sure that they have a disability because you're only looking at an avatar representation of the person, but you're likely to be cautious if the person does appear to be a little slow. And so the same, same for the white cane. But we also found that there were many who chose to identify. So in that case, they were choosing to identify as having a disability for a functional purpose in some respects. But there were many who weren't doing it for functional purposes, but purely because that was who they were. And they did not want to separate who they were in the physical world from who they were in the virtual world. So we found many uh, who would appear in a virtual wheelchair. But some of them would identify differently in different contexts. So Aliha would use a virtual wheelchair whenever she was hosting a community group support session for other women with disabilities. And yes, get the name, Gimp Girl. That's the name of their support group. But you would never see Aliha in a virtual wheelchair at social events outside of the disability community. So, you know, I'm, what I'm signaling here is there's diversity even in the virtual world about the way that people identify and see themselves and that changes in different contexts. So there's Aliha there and this is one of the GIMP Girl help uh, sessions. What was interesting is again understanding about diversity. GIMP Girl was set up for women with disabilities but they also opened it up to people who identify as transvestites. Um, and in fact, some people have gone into these virtual worlds to explore sexuality uh, before making life-changing decisions uh, that are not reversible. <laughs> At least you can reverse your gender in the virtual world. Uh, and that's Aliha dancing with someone who is now her husband, who she met in the virtual world, and Nick is, in real life, is um, a guy with muscular dystrophy who lives on a ventilator, okay? And they met in the virtual world, and then they married in the physical life. Incredible. This particular example is very touching because Nick was living in Alabama, and if you know anything about Alabama, medic aid services are almost non-existent. When you turn 21 in Alabama, you are not eligible for medic aid if you are on a ventilator. Try and work it out. You need 24 hour a day care. So Nick was, re was living in a house with a brother who had the same condition who was 30. He was in his 30s as well. A frail mother and a frail grandmother. And no aid. And so the virtual, commu and, and the virtual community become very supportive. He's a celebrity in Second Life because he's an advocate for people with disabilities. And so the virtual community ran fundraisers to raise money, real money, virtual money that was cashed into real money, to raise funds to move him from Alabama to New York where he could get appropriate care and support. And um, Aliha followed. <laughs> um, but the other interesting thing when I talk about the power of online communities for people with disabilities to um, harness collective power was that Nick ra uh, ran a campaign both through Second Life and through social <coughs> media to challenge the Alabama policies on medic aid and he managed to get exceptions for a large number of people. Now you've got to imagine this is a person who is isolated in a house totally dependent on the ventilator, unable to leave the house, he managed to rally a global network of people who came together to change public policy. That's very empowering. Now, I want you to take that concept to distance students. And when you think about the potential of this technology for enabling students in a range of different social and cultural context, students with disabilities to be able to fully engage with our, with our courses, no matter where they're located. It's got incredible power. But as you saw from the demographic study we did, it can also be 
a further barrier to them being able to realise their rights under the UN Convention. Um, and again, getting back to diversity, many people also with disability choose to not identify as having a disability because they want to be judged by who they are, not by what they look like. But many of those people would reveal that they had a disability once they gained the confidence of the French friends that they met. They didn't want to be judged at the outset, but they were quite comfortable to reveal that after, after all. And then there's another cohort of people that I encountered through my ethnography who identified all the time as a person with a disability and who in, embraced um, freakism, as uh, Simon puts it, which is, I guess it, it's drawing on Foucault's concept of power and resistance. Um, the fact that um, by identifying as a person with dis disability, they can in fact um, be very empowered. And I, perhaps the best example I can give you of my own experience of a student that I've recently recently graduated, one of my students who's just finished honours, is he's a guy um, with cerebral palsy in a wheelchair, electric wheelchair, with very significant speech impairment. And he, brilliant mind, he's now enrolled in a PhD and I'm a co-supervisor, I'm pleased to say. And that's an amazing achievement for a guy with the level of disability. This guy was raised in an institution, I should say. He was fostered, um, well, he was never fostered. He, um, he had respite care at times, but he grew up in an, in a, in an institution back in the, um, well, he's in his 30s now, so back when he was an infant, right through to when he was a teenager, it was still commonplace in, um, even in Australia to still have residential institutions for, for, for young kids with disabilities. In fact, that was my first job. And I always use the quote marks. I, my first job was with Crippled Children's Association of South Australia. Um, and we had the villas where these young kids would be. So he had no real family. Um, and he grew up in the, in the villas. A very, very brilliant mind, obviously, to have now got to the stage of uh, getting to a PhD. But also, he very much engaged in this kind of notion of power and resistance. And a good example of that was he was sick of people patronising him um, who would never actually listen to what he was saying because of his speech impairment. And so you've probably seen this happen if you've ever watched someone with a disability and a communication impairment trying to talk to someone who is patronising them and basically saying, yes, hmm, yes, I understand, hmm, yes, because they don't want to acknowledge. I mean, it would be better to just simply say, I'm sorry, I'm really struggling to understand your voice, you yeah? know? But no, they, they pretend like they're understanding, which is the worst thing you could possibly do for a person, especially a person who's brilliant, right? And he got sick of this. So one night when he was out at a restaurant, and this is the other common scenario, a person in a wheelchair gets talked, they don't get talked to, the people that are with them, get spoken to. So he was in this restaurant and and um, and what will your friend have? Mm. You know? And um, so he, he started to talk to the person and they started to say, hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. So he just added a few little questions like, and are you an idiot? And they say, hmm, sure. And, and then he burst out laughing and then they look at, hmm, what's wrong with him? You know? And so the last laugh was on him because he was actually uh, really uh, creating a power position where he was the one that was in, in control and in power. So um, that's another area of diversity in its own right, but I think it, it does illustrate that. So, um, uh, so Simon Stevens, um, Simon Walsh in Second Life, Simon Stevens in Actual Life. Uh, he's from the UK. So uh, that was another good, and there's a close-up. He also wears the helmet all the time, virtual world helmet. Um, I should say he started a Masters in Disability Studies in the UK and he dropped out because he was so disgusted with the patronising attitude of the people that were teaching the Master of Disability oh. Studies. <laughs> uh, and this particular guy who I've mentioned in my other presentation was really interesting. This guy um, is from, I think, Brazil and, stuff, and has agoraphobia. 
and he went into the virtual world, created his, that is exactly what he looks like in physical life, exactly. And he did that because he wanted to, uh, he was hoping that by experiencing the safety of the open spaces in the virtual world would transfer back into, into his own physical life. Didn't actually work, he just became safer in the virtual world. But having said that, he made very close relationships that he didn't have at all before. So that was a positive on the other side. So what this does is really illustrate the diversity of people, even with those we call those with disabilities. Not only in terms of the differences in terms of the physical impairments, but the difference in how they see themselves, their identity and how they relate to that, um, and how they interact with others. And again, it's really reinforcing the importance of us appreciating that when we're, we're teaching students from diverse backgrounds. Um, and I think it's breaking away from those essentialist notions of what it means to have a disability. It's about how we can empower our students with disabilities to be agents of their, you know, and in control and especially in the educational context. But the other area that I'm really interested in is also, I guess, I mean, you know, so really what I've been doing here is trying to problematise the whole notion of disability and these uh, binary divides that we continually uh, use to describe the, the, the population. But the other thing that I'm really interested in is, you know, the, the notion of the virtual versus the real, and um, some of you have been to my session, so I'm going to quickly flick through these. These are just background on Second Life. Uh, I'm sorry if you're not familiar with Second Life, but I don't want to bore those, you know, I'm conscious of time. So really this is just a couple, uh, uh, several slides that have really just talked about what it is about Second Life that makes it an interesting environment, or virtual worlds in general, for teaching and learning. And I give that as the context for, for, the, for the project that was funded by the Australian Learning and Teaching Council. So just in the interest of time and to flick through um, these quickly, I, really the advantages are that it allows students to undertake um, activities. How are we going? I mean, we've got about 10 minutes. Okay. To, active, uh, to undertake activities in a virtual space that is relatively safe where they can engage in online role plays and simulations and so forth. And there's growing interest in the ways in which we can use the affordances of these 3D virtual worlds effectively. I was particularly interested in also the fact that it, virtual worlds have proved to be a very safe place for diverse people from diverse backgrounds and how we could therefore engage with that in our teaching and learning to embrace this notion of diversity. And diversity in two different ways. There's the diversity of understanding how we need to accommodate for the differences of our student population, but it's also exposing our students who do not have experience of students with disabilities or students from non-English speaking backgrounds to better understand the, their peers and the differences in their peers. So virtual worlds are very much a constructivist learning environment, very much collaborative. Um, communication is a, is a rich opportunity for them to engage in process rather than product based learning. So again I want to, because we're short on time, I'll just summarise these points. Um, spatial knowledge, that would have come through when I was talking about the fact that even people who were blind in, were engaging with the virtual world. Why? Because of the richness of the audio. So 3D virtual worlds are spatial environments whereby um, the sound moves with the avatar. As you move away from an avatar who is speaking to you, the voice moves with it. So there's a very rich sensory stimulating environment which is audio and for people who are blind and visually impaired, that was what they were getting out of it that they don't get from a flat 2D web page. Right? So that was one of the important things. The experiential learning, the opportunity to do things in the virtual that's difficult or dangerous to do in physical life. The fact that it is an environment which is very immersive, the fact that we can um, apply the knowledge that we gain through these kinds of virtual environments into 
other real life situations and the fact that they do support collaboration, communication and teamwork. So we were interested in those possibilities, hence the Australian Learning and Teaching Council project. I've gone through these case studies many, many times, so I'm not going to go through them in detail, but I just, for those that haven't been to my presentations, want to say that as part of this project, we trialled the 3D virtual world across a large number of courses in a range of different disciplines. A lot of the work we did was role play simulations where students could play out the role either of a therapist and a, and a, a, um, a patient or a, a client, um, or we could allow students to experience diversity by changing their avatar and going out into the virtual world and experience how people engaged with them in a different persona. So one of the rich things about these kinds of environments is you can change your identity and then you can experience what it's like to be a, a, a someone from a different background. But you can also then experience how other people <coughs> react to you. So one of the important things I think about um, inclusive education is that we are equally training our students to appreciate diversity. So it's not just the deficit model, it's also saying that our students who don't identify as non-English speaking background or a student from an international background or a student with disability can appreciate the richness of the diversity and the best way to do that is to experience it yourself firsthand. The other thing that I did was I took my own students into Second Life to work with disability support groups doing service learning and those that have been to my presentations before will know the richness of the experience for my students who didn't have experience of working with people with disabilities. In this case, we've got a debriefing session where my students are meeting with representatives from disability support groups, and they're talking about their experience of doing service learning with these community organisations. And the classic example, which I gave earlier today, so I apologise for anyone that was at that session, was a student who was complaining in this debriefing session that the clients were never responding timely enough. I've got deadlines to meet. This, the clients aren't responding quickly enough. What's the matter with these clients? And the facilitator um, said, now, remind me which group you're working with. And he said, uh, well, it's the Attention Deficit Disorder Group, Lesson 101 in Disability. Um, and we had similar kinds of um, uh, moments for students who are working with other kinds of groups such as HIV AIDS they had very preconceived notions of the sorts of people that get AIDS because in the Australian context it's not a frequent experience for people it's very different from the South African context so again understanding the cultural context helps us to understand whether students really have very limited understanding of differences of other students. So this was a very rich way in which I could get my students engaging with groups that they didn't encounter in their normal everyday life, but in a relatively safe and scaffolded environment. And of course service learning has many advantages beyond that as well. Um, so the positive experiences for those students were they were able to apply their digital literacy, literacy skill in a, in a very artistic environment. They learned a lot more about the virtual world and the reasons that people go into these virtual worlds. Nearly there, yeah. Um, the provision of helpful tutorial environments, safe environment and so on. Um, Again, because we've got so little time, I just want to um, flick through, because I did just want to show you very quickly uh, an, a, an example of a prototype of something that we're hoping to develop in our next day, of the, a project if we get funded, and UWC is a partner if we do. So basically, the, the upshot of this project was we developed an accessible viewer for um, Second Life and OpenSim, open source 3D virtual worlds. We also developed a series of guidelines um, on how to accommodate, and I'll just actually try to summarize, I've got a summary screen on that if I can click. These were just all the issues we identified about the lack of accessibility for students from diverse backgrounds. Um, I've got a draft of our final report which has all the details of this if you're interested in it, but I just wanted to summarize 
Oh, sorry, it's this screen here. Um, so the, the, the sorts of things, so our, our research methodology was very complex and times against us to go through that, but it was a, uh, we had a range of sources of data to identify the issues of accessibility and the solutions and we created a set of guidelines. So it's things like making sure that um, you always provide text equivalents, whether it's in the web or whether it's in the virtual world providing synchronised streaming captions for videos, text transcriptions for audio, um, making sure that if you're using voice that it is actually converted to text, help functions, um, interfacing with any assistive technology rather than limiting to only the mouse, providing a web version of the virtual world for those on slow bandwidth who couldn't get into the media-rich environment making sure that the, even the website that's the help website's accessible. Things we can so easily overlook. Other features that our participants identified is um, uh, having support for mobile devices, and I'm pleased to see there are now some viewers for that. Descriptive content, ability to stop the built-in voice narration, which can get annoying. Um, provision of keyboard access. Um, now I'm going to flick through these. These, were, these are just the features that we built into, these are screenshots of the virtual world that we created that was accessible to students with disabilities. Um, so we developed a series of guidelines which you're welcome to get from the final report on all of these issues. I'm going to flick through these. Sorry, we're short on time. This is a summary of the things that our participants said were very, very important, including the breakdown of that importance. But the next slide summarises some of the additional things. They suggested making better use of soundscapes for blind users, make use of the audio environment, um, provide no notes for voice in sync with presentations, provide an option. Now, this was an interesting one. Provide an option, now this applies to all kinds of virtual learning environments, pro, um, online environments. Let the users who are studying externally register and identify that they have particular support needs. So you don't necessarily have to have mentors available for every session, but if you know students are going to have disabilities, then arrange for a mentor to be available. Minimise distractions watch the pacing of sessions to accommodate students who are going to be slower and provide internet relay channel for those which is what we did with our web interface okay and then there's a whole series of these guidelines that are available in the final report but just let me very very quickly switch you to this prototype that we're now it's easiest teaching and learning funding and it involves four universities in Australia with us as the lead. So we don't know where we're getting the funding yet, but it's basically to develop a series of um, evidence-based guidelines on how to create any kind of online learning environment to, so, to suit the diversity of student needs. And that was going to be evidence-based practice. And uh, again, it's a very detailed methodology, so we don't have time to go into it now. But if any of you are interested, given UWC is a partner, we might be able to include you in the study if we get the funding. That was part one. And the second part is we're actually developing a prototype of a personalised learning environment, which is adaptive. Oh, now I've lost my mouse. I'm taking it out. Uh, I have to try and do it from here. Um, and this is building on a project that's come out of the University of um, uh, Wisconsin-Madison, where they have been developing what's called the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure, which is a mouthful. Um, I'm wondering where my slide is at that now. But um, the, the idea is that... Uh, I'm just going to launch these again so you can see what happens when you launch the browser. The idea is that a student could log into their, their network, <coughs> set up a profile that says, I am a blind student and I need a screen reader. 
or I am visually impaired and I would prefer that the content is delivered with a black background and or yellow background and black text or you know 48 point font size or I am a student with a vision impairment and I really like a screen magnifier to use um, or I'm a student with disabilities who cannot use the normal keyboard but I want a touch keyboard on the screen or I find complex information really difficult and I'd like a simplified interface, please. So what they can do is set that profile up on the server. The server records also what technology they are using to access it. So it says, oh, they're on an iPhone. iPhones have built-in assistive technologies, okay? Or they're on a, 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 an Android tablet device. Or they're on a Mac or they're on a PC running Windows 8. Windows 8's got a lot of built-in accessibility features. Okay, they're on a computer that doesn't actually have a screen reader, but there are open source screen light readers like NVDA, which can be installed onto a USB stick. So what it does is when they log in, it marries their profile with the information about the technology to deliver the content in whatever format they need. Let me see, we'll try Michael Vargas. I can't remember what that profile is. There's the keyboard, all right? So I've logged in and Michael Vargas happens to be a profile that wants the on-screen keyboard, so it's immediately launched the on-screen keyboard. Let's try a new tab here. And I'll go to a different profile. And let's see, it's Andre. I can't remember who Andre is either. I'll get rid of the keyboard because it's a bit annoying there. I think that's meant to be the screen reader. Okay, so, and that's the open source screen reader, so they don't even need to have JAWS or Windows, it's just launched the open source. Um, List with now you know why I turned mute off. <laughs> we'll just show well, people that need a really clean, clear uh, visual interface. Believe it or not, this is Google Mail, <laughs> delivered in a very easy to understand and access so for a, a student who has a cognitive impairment but it's also really good for older people who don't really understand about technology so what that's doing is using apis linking into uh, the ability for us, many of the social media websites to be able to hook into that and then basically redevelop so you could build you could have facebook delivered in a simplified interface or um, Flickr or any of those so this is our, our next project, is to develop a prototype of this that works within um, the learning management system itself. We're going to trial it in, in Moodle and then develop the, the guidelines for developers of Sakai. And, but we may be able to adapt it to Sakai since we've got UWC involved and it is open source, so the principles should be the same. And the lovely thing about this project is that the University of um, uh, the, the person from the University of Wisconsin-Madison is also the founder of Raising the Floor International, which is an open source community, and they've committed their open source programmers to not only work on the development with us to make this adaptable for educational context, but they've also committed to sustain the project long term, uh, even after the project finishes. So. Um, our next hope is that we get that funding so that we can do this and roll it out. Um, I think we'll do it on a small scale one way or another if we don't get the funding, but you know, we'll see how we go. But UWC is a partner. Um, we've, I'm open to other, other universities coming on board because I think we'll learn a lot from the trials that will come out of this. So watch the space and we'll let you know if we're successful that the project would start in August if we are successful. So. Um, if you're interested in the detailed report with all of the guidelines, it's not officially published yet, but I'm happy to give you the draft version if you have that interest. Otherwise, we'll give you the link when it's officially published.
Thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Denise. You, uh, I see a, a large audience right um, sitting down there, and um, I'm so glad that you managed to do about four presentations in I one. I did. I, think. I did. <laughs> um, the the only downside is that we don't have much time left for questions. I think people might have to rush off, and we're also supposed to be having another presentation by Richard now. Richard Knight is going to be giving a presentation on Second Life and his use of Second Life. There he comes for people who can stay. But um, maybe in the transition between Richard setting up and um, Denise um, going, uh, I can just um, tell you that we, I don't know if you know about the Authentic Learning Colloquium, but next Friday there's going to be a colloquium on Authentic Learning. And Denise will be one of the uh, keynote speakers there who will be talking about 3D virtual environments and how they relate to um, authentic learning. We will also have Jan Harrington from Murdoch University, also in Australia, who's uh, well known for her, her work on authentic learning. And Alan Amory, who's apparently very entertaining from the University of Johannesburg. So it, sh it should be a really nice event if you can come. Um, and if you want to, I suggest you send an email to Michelle Grosh. Um, maybe if there are one or two short questions. Richard, do you need to set up? Well, <coughs> what we did... You're going to go there? Go okay, down. okay. So, so maybe it just one or, uh, one or two questions. Um, you know what I like about your presentations is they they're so um, well researched and you have such solid foundations for what you're saying um, which makes it very convincing I think um, and it's also nice to to look at the the different dimensions of um, what is known as disability mm. because I'm also of the view that um, we are all differently abled, not only at different times of our lives, mm. but at, at different times of the day. Yeah, and the absolutely. more one can accommodate <laughs> all those... We don't um, relate to that. <laughs> yeah, those yeah. differences, mm. the, the, the richer the environment can become. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, Denise.